introduce tonight's speaker. Mike, are you ready? Yeah. I, I, I hope so. Turn your thing on. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Michael McCurry is a professor at ISU. He's been a professor there for about 30, getting on to 30 years. Uh, he's currently chair of the Geosciences Department. His research specialization, geochemistry and petrology, volcanology. Uh, Mike got his Bachelor of Science in Geology from the University of Washington, his PhD from UCLA uh, for working on Miocene volcanoes in the Mojave. He's studied volcanology and volcanoes in the Rio Grande Rift, Yellowstone, China, also in China, Mexico, in the Andes and Chile, and in Spain. Uh, recent work is focusing on a connection between the young volcanic fields and active <coughs> geothermal systems in southeast Idaho and the geochemistry of water rock interactions in the eastern Snake River Plain. Some of that work uh, inclu included teaching and interaction with members of different tribes. Mike has served as a consultant to the Idaho National Laboratory and is a recipient of the uh, Department of Energy Faculty Fellowship. He's led many formal field trips and symposiums for international and national groups. He's a fellow of the Geologic Society of America and Geophysical Union, Mineralogical Society of America. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael McCurry. Thanks, Mike. Um, good evening. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm a petrologist, really. Uh, and as petrologists love rocks, so I just wanted to mention I brought a few rocks, which I invite you guys to have a look at uh, after the talk. And, and one of the, the, the principal themes of this talk is the Snake River Plain as a, as a volcanic wonderland. Uh, we've been in Pocatello now, as Mike mentioned, for 30 years, and uh, we love it there. We are on the doorstep of one of the world's uh, most active uh, volcanic systems, uh, both ongoing in the eastern plain, and of course we have our uh, friendly neighborhood super volcano just up, uh, up the road. So I wanted to, uh, to share with you guys um, some of what I consider some of the wonders uh, in the Snake River Plain. Not, not so much the, the craters of the moon area, or places that many people have been to, but it, uh, some places that are a little off, off the beaten path, but, but are still fascinating, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, how we think they, what, what they tell us about uh, the history of the region, and, and also try and point out uh, some of the paradoxes and enigmas that, uh, that they present uh, to us uh, as well. So this is uh, the Eastern Plain, where, where uh, oh, he did it. There we go. So we're in Jackson Hole, over here. Uh, this is a Google map image of southern Idaho, uh, the Wasatch Range sitting in here. So uh, we're sitting over here, and just over the, the Wasatch Mountains is this huge sag uh, in the, uh, the Earth's crust. Uh, really strange. If you look at some of the rocks to the south and the north, we have these enormous caterpillar-like tracks of mountain ranges that are associated with uh, the Mesozoic fold and thrust belt uh, and uh, basin and range uh, uh, tectonic evolution of all of Western North America. And then cutting right across the grain of these older structures is this uh, huge valley, which we refer to uh, as the Eastern Snake River Plain. So we're going to look at some of the features of the uh, volcanic rocks that occur in this, uh, in this region. Uh, just pointing out uh, some areas that you're probably familiar with and maybe, maybe some others not so much. Uh, these dark kind of blotchy areas across the plain uh, are um, young uh, basaltic uh, lavas, uh, the products of volcanic activity, mainly Hawaiian style, uh, basaltic eruptions that have occurred over the last 12 to 14,000 years. 
You go back past 14,000 years, there was a lot of dust out here, and it, it settled over the other basalts that also underlie the plain and give them kind of lighter shades uh, of colors. Uh, some of the places we're going to have a look at the plain, though, you may not have heard of. Uh, great, we're going to look at uh, some uh, uh, rhyolites that are associated with this hotspot track uh, system here uh, in, uh, near uh, Rogerson, uh, Idaho. Uh, we're going to have a look at uh, the, uh, the central part of the Snake River Plain. Uh, you've probably all seen the buttes. Uh, these are some really unusual types of volcanoes. Uh, and, uh, and then we're going to get off the plane a little bit and look at a very young volcano uh, that uh, you know, sits here uh, between the Snake River Plain and uh, here Lake called China, China Hat. Um, the hotspot hot track story is one that uh, you're probably familiar with to one, uh, one degree or another. Uh, this is a map from Bob Smith's uh, 2009 paper that uh, illustrate some of the key features of this, uh, of this uh, uh, hotspot track system. Uh, the, uh, the yellow circles uh, here indicate the ages of initiation of large-scale rhyolitic volcanism that have occurred uh, in the past in millions of years. And you might notice there's a, a distinct pattern here uh, in, uh, in northern Nevada, uh, the age of initiation. Each of these, by the way, is a Yellowstone-like system. So these are ancient versions of the uh, of Yellowstone volcanic system uh, that evolved over a few million years and then shut off, and then like, the, the volcanism shifted to the northeast. Uh, 16 million years here in uh, northern Nevada, we get into southern Idaho, the Bruno Jarvis system the activity starts about 13 million years uh, before present uh, in the vicinity of Pocatello, 10 million years marching progressively across the, uh, uh, across the uh, region. Now, one of the interesting features of this progression of rhyolitic or felsic uh, volcanism uh, is that it mirrors almost exactly the absolute motion of the North American plate that here is illustrated with this arrow. arrow. So we're drifting uh, here from northeast to southwest uh, at about two centimeters uh, per year. And that's if, if you run the numbers on the age of these volcanic centers, that's the apparent age at which they're drifting uh, to the northeast. Each of the uh, development of uh, these, these various volcanic fields across the Snake River Plain involved a prominent waxing and waning uh, in uh, the, uh, the uh, silicic volcanism that occurred. Uh, so th this diagram illustrates uh, uh, catastrophic eruptions uh, that occurred periodically associated with uh, some of the fields here in the, uh, in the eastern uh, plain system. So there's a little terminology that I'll, I'll use here. The, these fields are given reference names. So this would be the Twin Fall Twin Falls volcanic, oops, the Bruno Jarvis volcanic field in here. There's a Twin Falls volcanic field, so named for geographic features nearby. Uh, the Peekaboo volcanic field in this area, uh, the Heise volcanic field in this area, and then the Yellowstone volcanic field. Each of them undergo waxing and waning events lasting a few million years, uh, during which they produce super eruptions. And I, I'm going to show you a, a uh, and an art, artist rendering of what we think a super eruption might have been like uh, here in, uh, in just a bit. Uh, each of these eruptions uh, are associated with caldera forming processes. And again, we'll show you some examples of these as we go along. Um, the uh, development of these volcanic fields um, is, uh, is periodic. Activity will last a couple of million years shut off and then it'll shift over here, maybe 100 kilometers or so, last another uh, few million years going through this waxing, waning cycle, as, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, one of the enigmatic features of volcanism in the eastern Snake River Plain is as this locus of super volcanism has shifted to the northeast, in its wake, uh, there has been ongoing uh, basaltic volcanism. 
Uh, and that volcanism uh, begins here, you can see it as an example in the case of the Heise volcanic field. The last major eruption in this volcanic field formed the Kilgore Tuff, Kilgore Tuff about four and a half million years ago. And then almost immediately, this was followed by the eruption of these Hawaiian style uh, uh, basalts. Uh, and that activity is, uh, is continuing at an undiminished uh, rate. The, um, the development of the volcanic centers was accompanied by major tectonic uh, uh, processes as well, mainly uh, the sagging of uh, the, uh, the crust. Uh, this is a diagram that illustrates uh, the uh, development of the volcanic centers and then the development of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of sedimentary basins peripheral to the plain. Uh, and it's a record, uh, effectively, of uh, this uh, sagging process. So as the volcanoes marched across southern Idaho, uh, the region, uh, the region uh, uh, as the volcanic centers shifted to the northeast, the regions behind them collapsed, sagged. Oops. And this is an illustration of the sagging uh, here in a cross-section from northwest to southeast, uh, just north of the island. So they bring the rocks to the north, uh, continue along until they get to the plain, and then they sag downward a few kilometers across the plain, and then they, uh, they climb upward out of the southern end of the, uh, of the plain. So something has weighed the crust down during this volcanism that caused the crust to, to uh, sag. This diagram is a, uh, a depiction of uh, the Deep Earth, uh, uh, basically the, the thermal uh, state of the uh, of the Deep Earth. The brighter red colors illustrate hot mantle material. So this would be a region under the crust. Uh, you can see uh, uh, this crust. Here's the Snake River Plain. You make out the uh, outline of Idaho. Uh, the bright red colors represent very hot mantle underneath the uh, uh, underneath the crust. Here's the Eastern Snake River Plain. It's, is still hot, almost as hot as it is under Yellowstone. Something's sustaining this high temperature uh, in the upper, upper mantle under the eastern state of the plain. Um, here is a cross section from X to X prime, uh, and you can see the region under the uh, eastern state of the plain is anomalously hot to a depth of about 250 kilometers uh, until you get to Yellowstone, where this region of very hot mantle extends downward as much as almost a thousand kilometers uh, in the mantle. This has been interpreted by many uh, as a signature of a deep mantle plume. So these would be diapiric like features that um, many believe are generated near the core mantle boundary uh, and ascend uh, diapirically in the solid state as, as uh, owing to buoyancy associated with their, their high temperature until eventually uh, decompression results in partial melting and the production of basalt fluids uh, that then move into the crust uh, and uh, begin melting process, processes within, uh, within the crust. So this would be the mantle plume interpretation of the so-called hotspot track story. But it's not really a hotspot, it's more like a hot line uh, unless you only want to count parts of the mantle that are anomalous to very great depths. And that very busy diagram to, uh, to illustrate uh, where some of the data comes from regarding our interpretations uh, of, the, uh, of the development of the rhyolitic volcanic fields. Uh, the red colors here represent the products of the super eruptions uh, that uh, occurred here or there. And you see there, there's nothing, well, virtually nothing exposed in the plain itself. Uh, and so uh, figuring out where the sources of these rocks uh, are is, is, is difficult. Uh, and this has been uh, an effort of a number of volcanologists over the last 10 or 15 years, in particular, uh, to analyze the deposits on the periphery of the plain in great detail, looking at their, uh, it's basically a sedimentological analysis of the deposits to try and invert the uh, direction of emplacement in a way that allows us to identify the, sor the uh, sources that are now buried 
uh, under basalts uh, that, uh, that have been uh, produced subsequently. Uh, and then uh, the, the volcanic fields I mentioned before, the Twin Falls volcanic field and the Peekaboo volcanic field, uh, uh, additional new data has suggested the age of these fields is essentially synchronous, so there's some question about whether we should uh, distinguish them. Uh, and then the various dashed lines in here uh, are uh, representative of the uh, interpretation of the caldera systems from which the uh, rhyolites were produced. And you know, really, uh, the only point of this slide is to indicate that it looks like there were a whole bunch of them. And, and this is going to be an important element of the interpretation uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the volcanic rocks as we, as we go along. Uh, there are, uh, so how do we know the, there are volcanic rocks under here at all? Uh, well, there are geophysical techniques for uh, uh, inferring uh, low density materials uh, at depth. It's always nice to be able to see rocks. So there are uh, a number of deep boreholes very expensive endeavors, and there aren't very many, but there are a few, uh, and they penetrate the, the salts uh, and, and penetrate down into the underlying rhyolite, improving our confidence that, yeah, there really are numerous, uh, very, uh, very extensive rhyolites uh, in, this, uh, in this region. Uh, and then what I want to do is, is show you uh, a cross section through the crust here uh, in the center of the uh, eastern plain to have a look at. Uh, what we think of as the crustal architecture. Uh, yeah, looking at the margins uh, of the, so here's the plane itself. It's a, the, the topographic subsidence is a, uh, on average about 500 meters uh, relative to uh, the north and south parts of the plane. Uh, if you look at the left and the right, you see a layer cake type of stratigraphy. Uh, this is a Paleozoic and Mesozoic sequence of sediments that constitute the upper five or six kilometers of the crust. Uh, this sits on top of a, metam a system of metamorphic and igneous rocks. The upper part uh, is uh, Archean in age. That means two and a half billion years or more. Uh, and, uh, and the lower, uh, and granitic in composition. Uh, th th this is important uh, in regard to magma transfer through these systems. Magma transfer is driven by buoyancy. So the, the, dis, the difference, uh, the, the density of the surrounding rocks makes, uh, has an effect on how far these things can ascend uh, towards the surface. The lower part of the crust is more mafic uh, in, uh, in composition. Uh, and uh, we see basically the same kind of architecture north and south of the plain. But we, we get into the vicinity of the plain, and you see so there's been some profound modification such that as the, the Archean granitic upper crust is basically absent. Uh, and instead has been replaced by uh, much denser, uh, much denser material. Uh, the uh, uh, pink colors up here represent the uh, rhyolites associated with the supervolcanoes uh, that I mentioned that occur, uh, in, uh, we believe, in, in numerous nested uh, caldera systems and then these root into an underlying uh, granitic uh, batholith system. So this would be an interpretation of the current architecture uh, of, the, uh, of the crust in this region. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what a, uh, a super eruption is. And uh, I want to distinguish it from the kinds of eruptions that we normally associate with explosive eruptions associated with volcanoes. And this is roughly to scale. So th this would be Mount St. Helens stands about three kilometers above its surroundings, and it produced uh, a, a, a DEI-4 eruption uh, in 1980. It's, a, it's called the central vent uh, eruption because it, that's how it originates, from a pipe-like vent that extends into the depths. Uh, material piles up around the vent, producing the structures we usually associate uh, with, uh, with volcanoes. Uh, in the case of supervolcanoes, though, the, the eruptions don't occur in any particular spot. They occur in major rift systems that can be spread over areas of hundreds or even thousands of square kilometers. Uh, and they occur in, re in result to the rapid removal of, uh, of rhyolitic magma from shallow depth, and basically a roof caves in. And as a roof caves in, it produces pathways by which more magma can rise to the surface. So this is an artist's rendering of 
what an eruption like this might look like, where each of these columns are uh, issuing from kind of zipper-like fractures that are uh, concomitantly producing uh, these uh, caldera systems. Well, here are a couple of uh, examples of major vents producing a couple of these eruption columns. Uh, these eruption columns produce material into the atmosphere, uh, and because they're hot, they interact with the atmosphere to produce enough buoyancy to produce convection high into the uh, uh, into the stratosphere. Uh, and um, uh, uh, parts of the material uh, uh, will uh, uh, drift with the prevailing wind and produce ash fall uh, in the surroundings. This would be an example of what's referred to as a Plinian uh, volcanic eruption. In the first stage of development of deposits, is generally the development of an ash fall Plinian deposit. Uh, as the eruptions proceed, uh, changes in vent geometry, changes in, in the explosivity of the material that's being produced, uh, result in increasing density uh, of the eruption column to the point at which they become more dense than the surrounding air. So you get what's called column collapse taking place. Uh, and uh, this debris, uh, mostly hot ash uh, and uh, pumices, uh, collapse uh, into the surroundings in an avalanche-like uh, current, referred to as a pyroclastic density current, uh, from which uh, a deposit, referred to as the ignimbrite, uh, accumulates. Uh, as these uh, currents run across the ground, turbulence uh, and mixing with the surrounding air um, cycles uh, material uh, high into the atmosphere and then back down into the current uh, as uh, the, the, the current moves along the ground. This produces oscillations uh, in, uh, uh, in the, uh, the nucleation of water uh, in the uh, particles and producing what we call accretionary pillage. So this is kind of a standard model for a, uh, or a super eruption, and I'm going to keep this in mind when we start looking at, at some of these localities uh, in, the, uh, in the eastern plain. And here are a few real examples of the development of these types of uh, uh, eruptions. Uh, this is uh, the umbrella cloud that's produced when the convection into the atmosphere reaches a level of neutral buoyancy, uh, and then the material the ash drifts off into the surrounding producing the plinian. Uh, fall deposit. <clears throat> and then uh, here's a different eruption. Uh, here the, the column ha has uh, reached a point at which the, de most, the density of most of the column exceeds the ambient uh, air in the surroundings, so it, it uh, collapses uh, and then produces our pyroclastic uh, density currents. So this is kind of just a mind-sized image of these processes, and here are the products of these types of processes. Uh, the pyroplastic density currents uh, will produce, they're, they're very turbulent, so they're very uh, inefficient at sorting material. So you tend to get material that has particles of all sorts of sizes uh, 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 develop. This is, here's an ignimbrite up here sitting on top of uh, a plenty and fall. The plenty and fall accumulates like a, like a snow, uh, the accumulation of snow. So it produces very parallel bedded uh, uh, layers that mantle the underlying uh, uh, topography. The, uh, the density currents can vary in, in, uh, in, their, in the density uh, of material that's accumulating. If the material is accumulating very rapidly, it, it produces unsorted materials like you see up here. Uh, if it's an expanded current, it'll produce cross-stratified uh, deposits. In some cases, the deposits, uh, the, the, the eruptions are amazingly thermally um, efficient. They, they don't lose much heat. And uh, when the, uh, the uh, density currents produce the ignimbrites, it's so hot uh, that the material welds itself together, uh, producing what's called a uh, welded tuff. Uh, this is the location near Shoshone uh, in, uh, in California. This, this whole deposit is an ignimbrite. Uh, and you see in the middle, this kind of coal-like layer. This, this is the same as all these other materials. It's just been compacted and welded together uh, owing to the, uh, the very high 
uh, temperature. This would be a pretty typical example of a large ignimbrite. You will see that there, there are similarities and differences in the Snake River Plain. Uh, what happens if the, if the rhyolitic uh, magma reaches the surface, but it's depleted of all of its, uh, of its gases, the gases that, that produce the explosivity? Uh, in that case, they'll pile up around the vent. These are, these are very stiff, very viscous liquids, uh, and they pile up around vents to produce uh, what we refer to as lava domes. So this, there are different manifestations of the same thing. The, these are uh, magmas that in depth had volatiles dissolved in them, but they ascended very slowly, and uh, as a result, they lost those volatiles on the way to the surface, uh, and, uh, and then at the surface they had no capability for producing explosive eruptions, so they just piled up around the bed. Okay. So let's now uh, look at a few examples uh, in, the, in the plane. Uh, and we're going to start uh, at looking at the, uh, the products of uh, the first eruption from the uh, peak of the volcanic field, one that kind of sits in, uh, in this area, uh, that are spectacularly exposed uh, in a region called the Cove, uh, just off the Blackfoot uh, River. This is a um, exposure uh, of the deposit. This, this uh, from the dash line up here, it's about 70 meters of material accumulated from an eruption uh, at 10.2 million years. This deposit is referred to as the Argon, Arbon Valley uh, Tuff. It's a very important one to uh, geologists. Uh, it's, a, it's a datum that is, this is a huge deposit. It's a huge ash fall associated with this deposit occurs in many sedimentary basins around this, uh, around this region uh, and pr produces a data, a 10.2 million year old data that's used by these folks. <coughs> so we're going to look first at the base of the deposit uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, the Arvin Valley uh, deposit here. This is an ignobrite part of the deposit and then uh, it sits on top of about one meter of, uh, of ash fall. We'll look at each of these a little closer. Uh, the ash fall deposit is very well stratified, uh, uh, indicating it's a fall as opposed to an ignimbrite. And you might notice there's changes in granularity from finer grain to coarser grain. This is uh, called reverse grading is another typical indicator of a, uh, a planian ash column. So the idea is that this first part of the deposit is being produced by the umbrella cloud that I showed you uh, earlier. And then the umbrella cloud collapsed and produced uh, the uh, pyroclastic density currents. Uh, and if you recall, the uh, density currents uh, will produce these accretionary lapilli-like structures. This is a, a typical manifestation of a, uh, uh, of a density current. The uh, accretionary lapilli layer is overlain by more stratified deposits, but these deposits differ uh, from the Plinian fall and they are cross stratified. So they have dune like features that you'd see in sand dunes, uh, but uh, 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 these are not product of wind deposition, but deposition from a dilute uh, density current. And then in turn, those are overlain by uh, an unsorted material. Uh, it is again typical of, uh, of ignimbrites, uh, the type I showed you a little earlier. One of the, um, so those are some of the volcanological features uh, of this deposit. Uh, this is an ignimbrite that anybody who's looked at these in the, in the Great Basin, for example, would recognize. Uh, it's a non welded base, it's welded in the interior and then non welded at the top. Uh, one of the distinctive features of this ignimbrite is that it is very strongly zoned in its geochemistry uh, and, uh, and mineralogy. Uh, and we don't, the details aren't important. Uh, the lower parts of the deposit have very few crystals in them. Uh, the upper part of the deposit is very crystal rich. This is a time sequential re record uh, of the uh, magmas that existed in, in, a, in a magma chamber uh, beneath this uh, system. So the idea is these things erupt from the top down, so the material at the bottom represents 
the characteristics of the uppermost part of these magma systems, uh, and then uh, the last eruptive stuff would be from being plumbed from the deepest levels uh, of the system. A very strongly compositionally zoned, typical kind of, uh, uh, of ignimbrite uh, features. So now what I want to do is uh, move down to uh, a, uh, an area near the Salmon Falls Reservoir, uh, close to uh, Jackbox, right down there, uh, called the Grizz Landing uh, Ignimbrite. <coughs> This is the reservoir, and it, uh, this is a cliff about uh, 60 meters or so high. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the base of this ignimbrite deposit sits right in here. This is Mike Branny and, and Tiffany Berry. Uh, Mike is, is a renowned uh, volcanologist and sedimentologist, and Tiffany's a geochemist. Uh, the uh, base of the deposit runs right through here. Uh, and uh, we're going to take a look, closer look at, uh, at these deposits. Oh, a couple of features that are distinguished from the Arvon Valley uh, top. Uh, these are extremely hot when they're deposited. The, depo the magmas that produce the eruptions are, uh, are dry, very low water content. Uh, and in contrast to the Arvon Valley top, they're geochemically primitive. Uh, and I'll explain what some of these terms mean here uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit later. So these are distinctive features. Uh, <clears throat> the welding in these deposits extends all the way from the top of the ignimbrite through the base of the ignimbrite into the underlying uh, sedimentary strata. Uh, here's a close-up view of the ash fall from the base of the uh, of the ignimbrite, this material is, is solid rock. There's, there's no porosity in this uh, at all, but it's ash fall. What happened? Well, the, the idea is this material originally was uh, a porous ash fall material, uh, but then the uh, density current produced an ignimbrite, the contact is right about here, that was so hot that it welded not only the ignimbrite, but a thermal pulse moved through the uh, ash fall top and welded it, as well as underlying soil material. It baked the underlying soil, clay-rich soil, into a porcelain-like uh, uh, texture. Uh, this deposit now is about 30 centimeters thick. When it was originally deposited, it may have been as much as two meters uh, thick. In the ignimbrite itself, uh, there are some pretty amazing uh, structures, uh, folds of various types. Here's a large recumbent isoclinal fold up here. So how do you produce folds in, in, in an avalanche uh, deposit? Uh, here's a, a circular fold over here. Here's another isoclinal fold. So the, these are indications of strong strain uh, in the deposit, and it's a directional strain. Uh, the geometry of the folds, uh, many of them are referred to as sheath folds, and you can see the development of these folds in this uh, uh, sketch. Uh, the, the folds begin as a wave-like feature, uh, and the crest of the wave evolves more in some areas than others, producing a nose or a sheath uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the longitudinal direction of transport uh, of the deposit. Uh, these um, uh, deformation features occur at, uh, at all scale, and these become important in understanding the direction of transport of the deposit, because the shear is derived from friction between the uh, density current and the material that's accumulating at the bottom of the current uh, as it's being uh, deposited. So here's a, a cartoon representation of this very unusual style of uh, ignimbrite formation, where we have a density current in this cutaway illustration uh, that's moving from left to right and depositing material at such a high temperature that it immediately wells to the surface and, and produces a mat of gooey, hot, essentially lava-like material at the base of the ignimbrite that then is coupled by shear uh, to the current producing these, uh, these uh, sheaf folds. Uh, and the sheaf folds develop in a, in a linear pattern that allows 
volcanologist to uh, interpret the direction of transport, and then you invert that to figure out where the deposits originate. So those are some of the volcanological features of the deposit. Uh, these deposits uh, are hot, uh, and over time, you see here uh, a diagram that illustrates the accumulation of numerous ignimbrites. They become progressively hotter uh, over, uh, over time. So all of these are high temperature ignimbrites, uh, but during the, this, the development of the volcanic fields, Something's making them more uh, hotter and hotter over time, as well as more geochemically uh, primitive uh, over uh, time. All right, so this is a busy diagram, and uh, details aren't important, but in trying to understand the origin of the, the magnets that produce these deposits, we need some, some sort of, of a, um, a tracer toward, to sort out where the, uh, where the magnets uh, came, uh, came from. And this is uh, the best tracers uh, in these types of systems are heavy isotopes. Uh, and uh, we could use any, any isotope systems, but a couple, a couple that are commonly uh, used in this regard are neodymium and uh, strontium. And we're trying to understand uh, did, the, did the magnets that produce the deposits come from the crust, or did they come from the mantle, or some combination of the two? Um, so how do we know what the composition uh, of, the, of the original reservoirs uh, is? Well, the basalts, uh, we know, can only be produced from the mantle. So this green field represents what we refer to as the mantle reservoir. So if the magmas were derived from that system, they would register this isotopic composition. On the other hand, if the, the, uh, the magmas were derived by melting of the crust, uh, the crustal compositions uh, are constrained to uh, much different isotopic uh, compositions. What are the compositions of the rhyolites? Well, uh, the rhyolites that we were just looking at, the, these, uh, the rhyolitic ignimbrites, plot neither in the field of, uh, of the, that represents the mantle or the field that represents the crust, <coughs> suggesting that there's some interaction that's taking place between the two, so we can combine some crust with mantle to produce by mixing <coughs> an appropriate uh, isotopic uh, composition. So uh, you can run the numbers uh, on, these, uh, on these kinds of mixing problems, uh, which we've done. And again, the details are, uh, are uh, important. Uh, one important implication, though, uh, is in, in order to, to achieve the mass balance, uh, we need to transfer a, a, a lot of mantle material into the crust and then melt that combination of materials. How does that happen? So here I want to run you through a, a, a series of cartoons that illustrate the, the process as, as we think it has occurred. So here's a representation of the original uh, crustal uh, architecture. The crust is about 40 kilometers thick uh, under the snake river plain. And I mentioned the protozoelectin and the pelcic and mafic components of the crust. So the, the, the idea is that during initial waxing stages of uh, hotspot activity, melting uh, in the upper mantle produced basalt uh, magmas uh, that were transferred mainly into the boundary between the felsic upper crust and lower crust, because that's the point at which these ascending magmas lose buoyancy. Adding these mafic magmas to the crust upsets isostatic balance. This column of rock now is more dense than the original column of rock. So it'll be a tectonic response. So the surface then deforms downward uh, and um, producing the beginnings of, of, the, uh, of the depression uh, for of the state of the plane. <clears throat> More magmas are transferred into the crust. Uh, uh, an interesting observation uh, that, uh, that, that we have from geophysics is there, there's no deflection of, uh, of the MOHO. So if we're adding mass to the crust, if the surface coming down, we have a volume problem. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, the idea is that that volume accommodation occurs by ductile flow.
flow of the crust from regions under the plane into regions uh, uh, shouldering the plane, increasing the thickness of the crust and producing, as a result, buoyancy and therefore mountains uh, on the sides of the uh, uh, plane. Additional uh, uh, transfer of <coughs> these basaltic magnets into the crust gradually heats up the middle crust until the region begins to partially melt. But now we're partially melting a hybridized crust, a crust that consists partly of these old Archean, Felsic, and Mafic rocks and uh, older um, uh, basalts uh, that uh, intrude into this region. It, we have to mix these in the right proportions to obtain the isotopic uh, signatures that I mentioned uh, earlier. It's at this point uh, that the magmas gain enough buoyancy uh, so that they can ascend into upper crustal regions uh, where they can accumulate into uh, magma reservoirs and, uh, and produce volcanic uh, eruptions. Eventually, uh, the, uh, the hot spot uh, moves out of the region. Uh, the region cools off. Uh, additional basaltic magnets occur uh, uh, in the in the uh, in the waning part uh, of the system. Now, our area of crust that's been profoundly uh, basified, being made more dense by the addition of mafic magnets, and therefore the magnets are able to ascend all the way to the surface, producing the uh, basaltic volcanoes that we're all familiar with. leading eventually to uh, the architecture I showed you a little earlier. So this would be a composite uh, of all of the sequence of processes that I've, uh, that I've just uh, described. There have been some additional um, development in, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, interpretation of the magma chamber uh, architecture that leads to uh, the rhyolitic eruptions on the plain. Uh, in a paper by Drew and others, uh, they looked in great detail at the Arvin Valley Tuff and found chemical heterogeneities uh, in the top that require uh, uh, the tapping of reservoirs that were at least partially isolated from, uh, from each other. And she proposed, uh, instead of a coherent, one coherent large magma reservoir, it's more of a geyser-like system where there are a series of uh, interconnected uh, reservoirs or partially, uh, that evolve partially independently uh, from each other. And then uh, in uh, even newer work uh, by Cologne and others, looking in great detail at zircons, uh, zircons retain very efficiently uh, a signature of their history. Uh, and Cologne and others found evidence uh, for incorporation of zircons from all of the various parts of the system that we had inferred earlier uh, existed on the basis of, uh, of a, uh, a bulk analysis uh, of, the, uh, of the materials. <clears throat> the light oxygen paradox is a, is a kind of a new um, uh, twist in our understanding of the uh, state we were playing. Uh, rhyolites. Uh, if you look at the diagram here on the bottom, this outline of the plane, uh, uh, and then look at the composition of the rhyolites in, in regard to, to oxygen. So oxygen has two major isotopes, 18 and 16, uh, and uh, they, they, be, they behave differently. That uh, an important uh, aspect of oxygen it makes up most of the mass of the, uh, uh, of the rocks. Um, and notice uh, the uh, the, the composition of, um, of the mantle uh, and, uh, uh, and the Archean crust uh, has oxygen isotope ratios that plot appear at this level. What's the composition of, uh, of, the, um, of the rhyolites? And I, I want to refer mainly to this, these two volcanic centers systems, uh, the youngest volcanic systems, the Yellowstone system, and the Isaac system, this is a very interesting discovery made by Vindemann, uh, and his students, 
University of Oregon, and they found uh, that the first eruptions from both of these centers produced what referred to as normal oxygen isotope ratios. In other words, we, we could derive those magmas from some combination, as we mentioned earlier, of uh, mixing of crust and mantle. So they, they make sense. Subsequent eruptions, though, become progressively lighter. And they're too light. There, there are no uh, sources in the crust or the mantle for these very hot, light, uh, uh, very low oxygen isotope ratios. And we can't ignore the oxygen because it makes up most of the mass. So how, where could the light isotopes uh, have come from? Uh, and this is a, a, very, a very clever uh, model to produce plausibility scenario for the development of the isotopes. So here uh, we're using the Heising system as, as an example. Uh, the first eruption in the Heising system was uh, the Black Tail Creek Tough, which has normal oxygen isotope ratios. But I, I mentioned in, in these super volcanoes are produce calderas, and those are holes in the ground. So water moves into those holes. It's occurring in Yellowstone now, uh, in Yellowstone Lake. That water is, is meteoric in nature. And meteoric water is, has very low uh, oxygen isotope ratios. Uh, so that's the perfect reservoir. <laughs> if you can get meteoric water into the rocks, then we can account for the, these low oxygen isotope ratios. But the question is, how do you get it down to the region where subsequent <coughs> magmatism can be produced? And the, the mechanism that Denman proposed is that producing all these calderas, one is going to have to form on top of the other. And each time, the pre-existing hydrothermally altered material gets dropped down in each caldera forming event. So you can see here, here's the, uh, the black tail phase of evolution of the system. The oxygen is normal, but now water moves in there and then transforms the composition it moves light isotopes into these uh, uh, heavy isotope rich rocks and then the heavy isotopes go out into the ocean or someplace else uh, and makes the, the hydrothermally altered rocks uh, uh, lighter. Those rocks then get dropped down during the next eruption uh, into a region in which they themselves can be partially melted to produce the lighter oxygen isotope ratio. So what we're seeing is a really, I think, fascinating connection between atmospheric processes and magma generation processes. Okay, so uh, this is the, the, uh, the story um, for the super volcano related uh, rhyolitic uh, magmatism. But as I mentioned, uh, that magmatism has not shut off in the eastern plain. Uh, this diagram illustrates the spatial distribution of basaltic uh, magmatism that uh, overlaps these old volcanic centers. And unlike the old volcanic centers, there, there's no time transgressive pattern to the eruption of the basalts. They seem to occur randomly from vents uh, across, uh, across the region and even into regions that are peripheral, such as the Soda Springs uh, region. This diagram illustrates a, um, a map of the thickness of the basalts and indicates that they're thickest in the central part of the plain, uh, and then they feather out uh, towards, the, uh, towards the margins uh, of the plain. Yet the surface of the plain is flat, so this implies there's been progressive subsidence in the plain as the basalts have been accumulating uh, in, the, uh, in this region. So let's look at the uh, products uh, of these, uh, these types of eruptions. Uh, the vast majority of these eruptions produce low aspect ratio shield volcanoes. So the shield volcanoes uh, may have slopes of only a few degrees. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea is that the magmas are fluid enough so that they can't stay on steep surfaces. They drain off uh, uh, onto the uh, margins, becoming very broad uh, shield volcanoes. Uh, these uh, dominant basalts are uh, a type of basalt referred to as olivine foliate. Very primitive, they come almost directly out of the mantle uh, to, uh, to the surface. However, there is a, uh, another group uh, of shield volcanoes and 
uh, and volcanoes that are not shield volcanoes on the plane. Uh, Cedar Butte is, uh, is one of my favorites. It looks similar to this uh, tholeite shield, but these lavas, none of these are basalt. Uh, they, these are all intermediate composition of rocks. They, they vary in composition from almost basalt to uh, rhyolite uh, in composition. This is a new twist. Uh, and then if we look in the background, see Big Southern View, looks a lot like that lava dome I showed you earlier uh, in, uh, from uh, uh, Montserrat Volcano. This is rhyolite. This volcano is a rhyolitic lava dome. Uh, and this is a uh, evolved volcanic shield. So what, what's going on? So first, uh, touch briefly on the development of Big Southern View. Uh, it's a, a classic development volcanological perspective of what's called a cryptodome. Uh, and this ser series of cartoons illustrates the, the sequence of processes uh, where in this region there's a layer of basalt, inter basalt and sediment inner layers uh, about uh, a kilometer thick uh, that sit on top of rhyolites. The high porosity of the basalt gives them a lower mean density than the rhyolites uh, and as a result, ascending rhyolitic magmas tend to pond out at the boundary between the two. So initially producing a sill, and we think there are probably lots of sills uh, out there in the plain. In this case, though, the sill continued to inflate and then deform the surface. It's called a cryptodome. Uh, so it's, there's no volcanic eruption occurring at this point. Uh, and in the subsurface, we're developing a structure called a lacklin. Uh, in the case of uh, Big Southern Butte, uh, this cryptodome continued to inflate to the point where stretching uh, in the overlying brittle uh, basalt layer produced cracks. Uh, and that allowed tr for transfer of magma to the surface and uh, eventual development of a, a lava dome, half of which is uh, a flap of uh, tilted uh, basaltic pre uh, country rock. Cryptodomes are quite common. Uh, across the Snake River Plain, some uh, nice examples are the Buckskin Dome uh, near Blackfoot. Uh, if you drive from Pocatello to Idaho Falls, you drive right around it. Uh, and then across the Snake River is another one, very, uh, very view. Uh, both examples of Cryptodome uh, is, is uh, Middle View. Speaking of Middle View, here's a, here's a view of, uh, of the buttes in the, uh, in the Central Plain. Uh, they dot the, the, the re, right, uh, region right in the middle of the plain. Uh, some refer to this as the accident of volcanic zone. There's a concentration of volcanic vents in this region. Uh, some of them produce rhyolitic lava domes, such as uh, East Butte. Uh, there's another um, largely buried lava dome, referred to as unnamed Butte. Well, these are both rhyolitic uh, lava domes. Because this one's really old, it's been flooded by uh, younger basalts. Uh, Middle Butte is uh, another cryptodome uh, and it's cored by rhyolitic intrusion that never uh, made it to the surface but instead pushed up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the older uh, basalt. And then looking off into the background uh, we see uh, Cedar Butte and uh, Big Southern Butte. These rhyolites are really unusual <laughs> in a variety of their characteristics. Uh, they're hot, they're dry. It might remind you a little bit of uh, the rocks we saw uh, in Gray's Landing. They have unusual mineral assemblages. If, if you've taken uh, an intro geology course, you've probably heard of Bowen's Reaction Series, and it's a tool for understanding uh, minerals that uh, should coexist with each other, and, and two that you never think of coexisting are olivated quartz. Uh, and, and these are these rhyolitic rocks contain olivine and quartz and pyroxenes, uh, mainly as a result of the, the lack of water. Uh, and if you don't have water, you can't make micas uh, or uh, amphibians. Uh, they contain some very unusual textures uh, in some of the, uh, the crystals that formed prior to the eruptions uh, that, uh, that uh, are indicative of oscillations uh, in the uh, water content of the uh, original magma. So there's an interesting story in, in these younger uh, rhyolitic lava domes of open system interactions with respect to uh, volumes 
uh, and not, not just volatiles, uh, but other magnets. And it was something that uh, is pretty spectacularly displayed in Eusebian in particular, uh, is uh, a mixing that has occurred between, uh, a me and mingling between magnets of extreme compositional uh, variety. Uh, here is a rhyolitic magma, this is a mafic magmatic enclave. So this is a blob of mafic magma that was uh, intruded into the rhyolite, and then the two of them that were extruded to the surface. It's probably not accidental. Uh, the basalts are uh, much hotter than the, than the rhyolites, so it could be that this mixing event is what initiated uh, the, uh, the eruption. Um, uh, some of these magma blobs contain huge <coughs> felspars, uh, which suggest uh, to, to some geochemists that these may be a, a representation of the development of the bathlith uh, under the uh, snake river plank. So we have uh, one of the world's great bathliths developing uh, in the uh, interior uh, U.S. Uh, as we speak. Um, so in some cases, uh, the mafic magmatic enclaves, such as this one, contain other <laughs> Mafic magmatic enclave. So it is evidence of the intermingling of fluids of extreme composition uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the same time. So we're seeing uh, the present evidence of the presence of uh, multiple magma types uh, deep in the surface beneath the eastern plain uh, at present. And we have examples of, of these samples up front. I encourage you to come uh, have a look at them. Uh, this is a uh, exhumed dike uh, on the flank of the Cedar Butte uh, volcano, uh, which is a different scale of this mixing process. So here's the, the end of an upward propagating crack that was filled with, uh, with magma from depth. The outer part of the uh, crack uh, is very low silica content, uh, almost uh, basaltic in composition. Uh, and in the interior is uh, rhyolitic uh, magnets. So these magnets were getting plumbed upward simultaneously. Uh, Cedar Butte Volcano is, uh, is bigger in the uh, subsurface than it is at the surface. One of the, the, this is a, a map that illustrates Big Cedar Butte. Cedar Butte sits over in this area. Uh, it, the, there are numerous boreholes that the Iowa National Lab has drilled in this area that allow us to uh, infer the presence of this shield volcano into the, uh, into the surroundings. Uh, the shield volcano, as I mentioned earlier, is, is intermediate in composition. Uh, and uh, if you run the numbers on these intermediate uh, the details that yeah, aren't important here, it's just we, we have run the numbers um, the amounts of various types of volcanic rocks in the area. Uh, this area for many years is considered uh, as a classic bimodal volcanic system. It's produced basalts and rhyolites, but nothing in between. Uh, and uh, the intent here is in running the numbers is to illustrate that's actually not the case. That there are a lot of rocks of intermediate composition, uh, many of them uh, beautifully exposed at craters of the moon. Uh, and, uh, uh, suggesting that there's a connection uh, between the, the rhyolites and the, uh, the, the genetic connection between the rhyolites and the, uh, and the basalt. One of the problems is uh, that the intermediate rocks are just as dark colored as the, uh, as the basalt, uh, which makes them uh, get lumped uh, unless you do uh, chemical analyses uh, of the rocks. Uh, let's see. So. Um, I think we've already covered, this is just a map that, that it illustrates the development of these shield volcanoes incrementally. Uh, and uh, what is the possible connection? So the, the details in this diagram, again, are not important, but I'm going to focus on this particular uh, uh, diagram. This is an illustration of the range of compositions uh, of volcanic rocks associated with uh, evolved volcanic systems. Uh, and uh, silica content represented on the horizontal axis and then magnesium in uh, the vertical axis in this diagram. The uh, dominant olivine foliates that I mentioned earlier had very little variation in chemistry. So this would be something like 90% of 
of the rocks in the eastern plain, the salts, of a very, very narrow range of chemical composition. On the other hand, the, these intermediate composition rocks have this enormous range of composition, uh, represented by craters of the moon in this region, and then overlapping with Sierra Butte that extends the range of compositions all the way out to the most extreme values, uh, uh, rhyolitic uh, uh, silica concentrations. Um, and then there are uh, additional uh, volcanic rocks whose composition plot along a line connecting the extremes of magma composition. So we think what we're seeing here is a representation of two different processes that are going on. One, there is a connection. So the hypothesis is that these basalts, in fact, can chemically evolve, as Bowen has suggested, to produce these highly differentiated rocks. Uh, these, these curved linear patterns cannot be a product of mixing, um, but they, they, they are plausibly the result of a Bowen's reaction surface like uh, 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 chemical processing of the magnets. And then occasionally, the rhyolitic uh, evolved magmas interact with mantle-derived uh, uh, magmas to produce a linear pattern of uh, chemical compositions. So this is a working hypothesis. Is it consistent with the isotopic characteristics of the rock? So this field in yellow illustrates the isotopic composition of the young rhyolites. Uh, that field overlaps with the salts. Okay. So uh, the big southern view does not require melting of any pre-existing crust. So that material is isotopically the same as the mineral. So this connects this, uh, if we go back to this diagram, this is consistent with this idea that the, that the mantle itself has chemically evolved, uh, uh, but not isotopically evolved. skip through these. It, these are uh, just running the numbers on the details of these mixing processes and achieve, we can achieve a, a mass and energy balance uh, in, the, uh, in the magma evolution pathway that I showed you. Uh, so that's consistent with mass balance, consistent with energy balance. Can it actually happen? So we collaborated with some folks uh, at, uh, at SUNY uh, who uh, have devices that we can do experimental work uh, on. So we put the salts uh, in these experimental devices under conditions we think occur in the crust, and then watch uh, how they evolve uh, as, uh, as they undergo uh, evolution. And this diagram uh, illustrates there's a, a beautiful overlap uh, between the experimental data and the observed data. So this is, this is experimental uh, verification of, of our uh, hypothesis. So, uh, in the case of these later rhyolites and the intermediate composition rocks in the plain, uh, this is quite different than the generation of rhyolites that occurred uh, in association with the uh, super volcanoes. Uh, these are formed by extreme uh, fractional crystallization, magma evolution of the salts. Uh, if that's the case, if we see a rhyolite at the surface, there has to be a whole lot of magma that gave rise to those rhyolites at shallow depths. And that's significant because it may still be hot. Uh, and so this has given rise to uh, a search then for potential geothermal uh, resources uh, in the uh, Snake River Plain uh, region. OK, uh, so in that, uh, this is a segue uh, to uh, our, uh, our last uh, volcanic system, and this is one uh, in the vicinity of Soto Springs, and uh, probably most of you have been to that, uh, that area, uh, and you can see the geyser uh, going off. It's, it, it's so named uh, because there's so many um, uh, carbonated water springs uh, in, this, uh, in this region. But there are also uh, hot spots in the region of, uh, of Soda Springs, uh, where the geotherms are very high. Uh, this is Blackfoot Reservoir. Uh, Soda Springs itself is rough in here. It's Alexander Reservoir. 
Uh, there was a big earthquake swarm that you may have heard about during the fall. Uh, that occurred right on this bullseye over here. These red colors represent high heat flow. So we have a, region, a very large region of high heat flow north of Soda Springs and then another one east of, uh, of Soda Springs. Uh, and then in between the two are, uh, is this big volcanic field uh, called the Blackfoot Volcanic Field. Uh, these tan colors are the uh, representative of the salt lavas that have accumulated. The salts generally are not associated with geothermal resources because they come out of the mantle. So that the, the, the source of heat is too deep. Uh, rhyolites, on the other hand, come from shallow depths. Uh, right in the middle of this system is the youngest uh, uh, suite of rhyolitic lava domes outside of the Cascades uh, in, uh, in North America. And they produced uh, China Cap, China Hat, and, and a series of other uh, rhyolitic lava domes. So one of the hypotheses we uh, wanted to test is, could the heat here have moved over here somehow? Is there any other evidence of um, uh, the presence of magnets at shallow depths? Uh, and the answer is in, uh, in the geochemistry of the springs, um, unlike uh, spring systems uh, in other magmatic associated uh, uh, geothermal systems, there's very little indication uh, in the water's uh, uh, usual chemical parameters uh, of, um, uh, of hot rocks at shallow depth, and this has this is made a lot of folks who were exploring for geothermal energy back away from, from this region, but one of the issues uh, here is that there is a lot of meteoric water moving rapidly through these rocks that would dilute the signal associated with deeper hydrothermal systems. But there are some tools that are pretty good at probing through these kind of mixing interactions, and one is related to a specific isotope system, in this case helium. Uh, helium-3 is a, is a form of helium that is primordial. It's not formed by any natural decay process, whereas helium-4 is a byproduct of uranium thorium decay. So the idea is that really helium-3 rich waters are rooted to some magmatic uh, uh, source at, uh, at shallow depths. Uh, and uh, there are any numbers more than about, less than about two, uh, this is a, just a normalized ratio of helium. Any numbers less than two suggest that there are shallow magnets. And that, in fact, is characteristic of uh, many of the spring systems in the Soda Springs area. This is a study done by a group at Berkeley uh, Wiki uh, and uh, others. Uh, they also showed that the springs, the nature of the carbon, the carbon isotopes are also uh, 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 of, a, of a character that is associated with shallow uh, magmatic systems. And the traver there are numerous travertine deposits forming in the Soda Springs area as well. Uh, in a student, Rebecca Woolley has studied these in great detail, looking at their geochemical characteristics, again, as potential probes of geothermal activity at shallow depths, and she's identified a variety of uh, thermogenic characteristics uh, to the uh, to the travertine deposits. So we're beginning to develop an interpretation uh, uh, that that uh, is consistent with the possible presence of what's what referred to as a hidden or blind geothermal resource uh, in the region. Uh, to um, to assess the possible connection. Uh, between the rhyolitic reservoir system uh, and, uh, and this heat source, um, a student, uh, Ryan uh, Goldsby, uh, I just skipped through a couple of these, looked at um, uh, looked at uh, quartz hosted melt inclusions. The picture in here. Just skip through some of these. Yeah. So there, here's a quartz crystal, uh, and trapped in these quartz crystals as they grow, uh, they, they capture um, uh, samples of the magma from which they're uh, forming. Uh, and uh, uh, Ryan worked uh, with a colleague uh, in Heidelberg, uh, Germany, uh, who does uh, uh, ion probe types of work that can identify the water content 
uh, of these uh, mountain inclusions. And what he found are uh, very interesting is that the, there, there's a heterogeneous assemblage. There's a water-rich group of quartz crystals. Uh, there's a group of quartz crystals that have intermediate water content, and then a, a group of quartz crystals which are, uh, are, have basically no, no water uh, present uh, in them. Uh, the, the, the solubility of water in, the, in magnets is highly, highly pressure dependent. So Ryan's interpretation uh, was that the magnets that are generating these systems may have started with this amount of water, but by the time they erupted, they had lost all of these waters. Uh, and that, that's a, a volatile flux we can quantify. Uh, and and uh, you see in uh, this, uh, this table, uh, depending on whether we started with 4.5 or 2.7% uh, water, these magnets alone would have generated uh, uh, on the order of um, uh, 10 uh, to, uh, to 120 or so megatons of, uh, of water during their ascent from uh, source reservoirs uh, to, the per to, the, uh, to the surface. So these waters uh, are lost to the surroundings uh, along with whatever is soluble uh, in the uh, water. Uh, as well as the heat associated with this water. So where did it go? So in, in Ryan's interpretation, uh, the idea is that the, the waters that are lost from these uh, ascending magmas interact with structures in the surrounding rocks, which are dominated by thrust faults uh, in, this, uh, in this region. Uh, the thrust faults are tilted in a direction that would transfer the water from the China Hat region uh, 10 to 15 kilometers uh, to the uh, to the northeast, in a, in a, in a manner that is consistent uh, with the uh, with the uh, geothermal hotspots that I had mentioned uh, a little earlier. All right, um, there have been a number of folks uh, in, in Idaho State who have been involved in this this attempt to understand uh, the possible connection of some of these young rhyolitic magmatic systems with geothermal systems, uh, including a group here that won a national competition uh, a few years ago. And of course, this, is, uh, this work is the result of uh, some amazing collaborative interactions with a whole uh, array of folks, from, mainly from from England and Germany uh, and, uh, and the U.S. <coughs> okay, and that's all I've got for you tonight. Thank you.
So it's for me, are you familiar with this term? So this is just a different a way of uh, looking at the difference in, in the abundance of oxygen 18 and 16. Is used per mil? Per mil? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one, one. Part per thousand. Per thousand. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Your geophysical diagram suggested that the hot zone is one coherent package. Uh, is it really that, or a series of pods here and there that are contributing the that? Good question. Oh. <laughs> it's, um, I only know enough to be dangerous when it comes to interpreting these geophysical data. <coughs> I know there are some geophysicists uh, that, that don't that look at the same data and interpret it differently. But I think it's reasonable to say that under the plane, it's really hot. Uh, and that under Yellowstone, it's also really hot, and it's hot deeper. But how, how deep and all that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the interesting arguments and uh, controversies in geodynamics now in this region uh, concerns the development of plumes uh, and whether all plumes originate at the core metal interface. Uh, that's a great place to generate them because you've got a thermal uh, uh, um, boundary layer there. Uh, but there are others who think that, for example, uh, uh, the uh, uh, old slabs, old subductive slabs, uh, as they settle, produce uh, counterflow patterns that would resemble flows. And, and I think that's quite controversial at this point. Sir? Um, on the geothermal question, is there any way to estimate the uh, geothermal reservoir? How much is there? How many yeah. megawatts or whatever you pull out? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. Uh, uh, John Wellham, uh, a um, a geochemist, uh, he just retired recently from the Idaho Geological Survey, ran exactly that analysis for these, the hotspots that John had identified. He, he had uh, uh, obtained funding to drill some thermal gradient holes in the region, and he combined that with pre-existing data. And he estimates there's something on the, on, on the order of a gigawatt potential. Per yeah. hole? I think collectively. And that there's a paper I can send you if you're interested in that. Uh, so if, uh, if there are no more questions, we're going to do the usual uh, thing with the chairs. The chairs on this side.